Okay, go ahead, there is. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be able to join you, even if it's only briefly uh, tonight at the beginning, anyway, for tonight's talk for, with uh, Richard Doherty. I want to thank Stephen, first of all, for the kind invite uh, to come along and just to briefly introduce tonight's chat. So, Richard Doherty is obviously Richard's guest, or Stephen's guest, rather. And I've known Richard now, I think, for well, I'm sure it's six, seven years. And I know I know him to be a very, very good personal friend, but also to be an author and researcher of genuinely of the highest caliber. Pretty much any cursory uh, Google search you will do on Richard Doherty will describe him as Ireland's leading military historian. I think, and hopefully so, by the end of tonight, you will confirm that view. I have found him to be a researcher and a historian of the highest calibre. And what I would say to you with great honesty tonight, and frankness actually, is that if Richard says it, you can be pretty much certain that's how it is. I don't want to say too much more, but Richard is an author of many, many books. And he hasn't paid me to say any of this, by the way, folks. But if you get a, a chance, you'll see that one of my one of the books that sits on the bookshelves behind me here in the rectory study is this one, which is Richard's work on the siege of Derry, which you're about to discover tonight. And you'll discover many things. What I discovered when he did this talk for myself to a group uh, down in Macarat was that what you think you know isn't really the real story. It's much more varied, much more complex, and much more interesting. That's Richard's um, uh, book on the subject. I recommend it highly. In a similar vein, this is his work on the Williamite War. Excellent, absolutely excellent account of battles and, and encounters that have shaped our island ever since. And then beyond that, Richard's real passion, I think it's fair to say, lies in probably the Second World War, where his father fought with, with valor and victory. Um, I have many of his books um, recording the history of particularly Irish regiments as they served throughout the Second World War, but also on Normandy and D-Day and so forth. So I'm going to hand you over now to my friend Richard. I really hope you enjoy the night. And all I would say to you is quite simply this. Listen with fresh ears, and if you get an opportunity at all to read or to buy any of Richard's work, then I can recommend it wholeheartedly and without reservation. Now, sadly, I have a briefment in the parish. I'm going to nip out and, and deal with a, a few items concerning that, and I hope to come back in at some point. But have a wonderful night and enjoy everything Richard has to share with you. God bless you. Well, thank you, Rhys. Um, can everyone hear me? I hope they can. Yep, we can all hear you. That's good, that's good. Um, this is not local history. It's not even Irish history. It's not even British history. It's European history, and it actually has a world flavor because in a sense, it helped in a number of ways to shape the world that we now live in. So it isn't just a little piece of parochialism that belonged to the, the Derry ones. It, it's something that uh, still lives in a very, very real sense in many aspects of, of our lives. And incidentally, I'm a Tyrone man saying that, not a, not a Derry one. Um, the siege of the city actually was the third siege that the, the city endured in the 17th century. And it was the most significant of those sieges. It's become known as the, the Great Siege. And the historian Macaulay once referred to it as the most important siege in English history, which sounds rather strange because it's not in England, it's on the island of Ireland. But what he really meant was that it was the most important siege in British history, because this was a siege that was part of a British civil war, the second civil war of the 17th century. It was 
a siege that was part of an Irish civil war. It was a siege that was part of a major European war that helped to shape the continent of Europe and in a, a, a broader sense, actually helped to shape the world in the centuries afterwards. So it's part of this uh, Williamite or Jacobite war uh, in Ireland, really from the end of 1688, from the, the deposing of King James II, uh, right through to 1691, and you can stretch it into 1692. So it's a major conflict. If you look at the map, you can see the places that are touched, and really everywhere, every county in Ireland was touched by this war. You can see the uh, the diamonds that mark sieges, and you can see in Ulster, uh, this this the sieges at Coleraine, Carrick, Burgess, Belfast, and Bangor, and Charlemagne. Newton Butler and Enniskillen, and just slightly outside of Ulster, uh, Sligo and Dundalk. Uh, and they go on, there are battles, you can see Ockram marked there, you can see Drogheda, uh, you, you know, you, you really can even see a naval battle down in Bantry Bay. Uh, and that was a, a very, very significant uh, aspect of this particular war. What, what was the war all about? Well, it was about the British succession, who was going to be the king of uh, Great Britain and Ireland. It was also about who actually ruled Great Britain and Ireland. Was it the king, was it parliament, or was it the king with parliament? And it came to head in a sense because King James II of England uh, he actually was the sixth, seventh of Scotland, not the sixth as it's marked down there. Uh, King James II had failed to have a son by his first wife. He remarried and his second wife gave birth to a son. Problem was that James II was a Catholic. And at that stage, nobody really wanted a Catholic king on the throne. And this looked as if it was going to be at the beginning of a Catholic dynasty. So he's, he's deposed, uh, and we'll not go into the details of that because that would take us all evening as well. He's deposed and replaced by his son-in-law and nephew, keeping it in the family, William Henry Nassau, who was the um, leading Dutch politician, shall we say, of his day, but he was also the Prince of Orange, small principality uh, down in Provence in France, from which uh, his people had been summarily dismissed by the French who had taken over uh, that little principality, which meant, of course, that there was a certain friction between uh, William Henry Nassau's family and the French monarchy. William Henry Nassau, Prince of Orange, later King William III, but only in England and Wales, King William II in Scotland, and plain King William in Ireland because Ireland had never had a King William or a King Liam beforehand. James, even the artist couldn't look and make him look a particularly attractive individual. Uh, he was a rather loose character. Uh, he still believed in the divine right of kings, so therefore everybody does what I say. And uh, that really, in a sense, led to his, de his deposition. He supported in this war by King Louis XIV, who gives him sanctuary in France. Louis XIV is known as the Sun King or the Great Louis or the Grand Louis. Uh, Louis's ambitions were for France to dominate all of the continent of Europe. And he'd been working uh, through his monarchy uh, for, that very, for that very end. Uh, so you've got Louis XIV, you've got James II, and you've got William, Prince of Orange, who becomes King William III. It used to be called the War of the Two Kings. Then it became known as more recently in the last 50 or 60 years, became known as the War of the Three Kings. More accurately, um, and, and this is our friend James again in, in armor, trying to cut a fine figure. It's the War of Three Kings and a Pope. This is Pope Innocent XI. Benedetto or the Scalci. Uh, if anybody's ever been to Bracciano and visited Castle Bracciano, 
that was the Odescalchi family home. So how does he fit into it? Well, he fits into it because William is invited to come to Britain to take the throne. The Dutch Estates General, um, and, and he basically is the, the chief man uh, in that uh, organization and that administration, doesn't really have the funding to send a military expedition to England. So they go looking for money. They go looking for a massive loan. And who do they go to? They go to the biggest banking company in the world at the time, the Otis Calci family. And it's on the recommendation of Pope Innocent the Eleventh that a Protestant king is supported against a Catholic king. So the money is granted uh, on the intercession of the Pope by his family and the other Italian bankers. It goes to the Dutch government. We organize a fleet and an army which comes across to England. Now you've all heard, we've all heard that that fleet came across with a Protestant wind. What you probably didn't know was that it came across with a Protestant wind and Catholic money. And so William comes to England and the civil war begins. Rarely is it called a civil war, it's more often called the glorious revolution. But the war has begun. James is in France in exile, seeking the help of Louis XIV, who really isn't prepared to help him other than to achieve Louis's own strategic aim. So James at this point has become very much a pawn in a massive power struggle. James has got some uh, competent commanders in what's going to become the Jacobite army in Ireland. Chief among them is his illegitimate son, James, James Fitz James, the Duke of Berwick. He had an even younger son who was 19, who became the Grand Prior and actually commanded a regiment during the war in Ireland. Uh, he, he's got the support of the French, and as much as the French are prepared to give him money, they're prepared to give him uh, equipment, um, usually old equipment that the French army wants rid of. They're prepared even to allow a French fleet to take him to Ireland. But that's about the height of it. They don't commit the French Navy to the campaign in Ireland. If they had done, it might have been a very, very different story indeed. So we're looking at a few other people who play principal roles in this war. Richard Talbot, the Duke of Chirconnell, was James's Lord Deputy, basically the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. And James had warned Talbot that uh, in dealing with the people of Ulster, many, many of whom were Presbyterian uh, rather than established church or Catholic, that he ought to treat the Presbyterians favorably, ought to treat them the same way as he treated the Catholics because they had grievances against the established church. Instead of which, Talbot decided that he would treat the Presbyterians just exactly as he would treat the established church. Uh, and instead of uh, a Presbyterian Catholic alliance in Ulster, he created a Presbyterian uh, established church alliance, albeit with some frictions, which we will we'll hear about later on. And this is interesting. This is, is it, this is a letter from Sir Connell. You can see his, his signature in the bottom uh, to the Earl of Antrim. And the Earl of Antrim has been given instructions at the uh, end of uh, November of 1688 to take a command of the city of Derry. You can see that a, a little bit down the, the, the letter. But in the very first line, Talbot actually re refers to the people of London Derry obstinate in their rebellion. Uh, so these are the, the people in the city itself within the walled city, which had been built in the early part of the century after the destruction of the old city of Derry by the O'Dohertys and McDevitts, uh, and obviously uh, but rebuilt with the money from the London companies, which gave it the prefix uh, of London. And so these are rebels, according to Chirconnell, and they become the object of uh, the Lord Deputy's uh, anger and, uh, sorry, 
we're rushing ahead here, uh, his determination to stamp out this rebellion. So there's a war basically in Ulster. There's a campaign in Ulster. The series of battles uh, east of the Ban, uh, and uh, particularly if you look at Drummore, Drummore there, the uh, battle known as the Breck of Drummore, in which uh, an army opposed to the Jacobites was defeated and broken. Uh, you then have the crossing of the River Ban, Port Glenone and Kilray, the siege of Coleraine, uh, the advance of an army into uh, through Newton Limavady uh, up to the city of Londonderry. Now, a little bit before that, uh, as I said, in 1688, when Sir Connell had sent his letter, uh, you had the, of course, the closing of the gates of the city by the apprentice boys. Now, they weren't actually closed against a Jacobite army. All they were closed against was a small group of officers or reconnaissance group who had rowed across the, uh, the River Foyle, walked up or marched up to the, uh, the ferry gate. And uh, the then bishop, uh, who was Ezekiel Hopkins, uh, had said that these people are the king's army, the king is God's anointed, and there were, therefore we should allow the king's army in. Uh, a Presbyterian minister uh, decided that he would encourage the, the, the crowd otherwise, and a, a group of apprentices, not necessarily young, because apprentice didn't always mean a, a teenager in those days, uh, they seized the, the gates, the keys, of the gates of the city. They ran round and they closed all four of the, the city gates. Uh, the, the original locks, the original padlocks and the keys are actually still today in the, in the chapter house museum in St. Columns Cathedral. And, and these are just two of them with three of the keys. It's been celebrated and has been celebrated uh, uh, ever since the shutting of the gates. Uh, it actually occurred on the 7th of December, but with the change to the, um, the Gregorian uh, calendar, uh, it began to be celebrated on the 18th of December, but now is normally marked uh, on the first Saturday of December each year, rather than the, the correct date by the calendar. That's, that's the first instance. That now sets the, uh, the, the people of the city at odds with Turconnell. And you have this army that we've mentioned in East Ulster moving into uh, West Ulster. Then in March, James arrives in Kinsale, marches up to Dublin, summons a parliament and takes another army uh, to come up to uh, the west side of the, of the province uh, through um, Tyrone, Charlemont, Oma, uh, and then across the border into Donegal and down the, the western bank of the Foyle towards the city. By this stage, uh, we know, of course, that um, the Earl of Antrim's regiment, which was sent to garrison the city uh, at the beginning of December, has been told to go away. That was the reconnaissance party, and they marched off, um, not never to be seen again, but to, out of the picture for, for a short period. Uh, some of the original garrison regiment, uh, commanded by, by um, Lord Mountjoy, who had gone to Dublin to be disbanded and to have the uh, Protestant officers replaced by Catholics and the uh, Protestant soldiers replaced by Catholics. Um, actually, were, it was sent back by Turconnell, who realised that maybe he just overstepped the mark here. Uh, he sent them back to, to Derry to take over the, the garrison. Uh, they were actually told they weren't coming in. Uh, and it seems that the, the people in the city uh, had some fairly good knowledge of the composition of the regiment because they, de they demanded that the only soldiers of Mountjoy's regiment uh, who would come into the city would be those who were Protestants. So there's a very strong indication there that there were already a large number of Catholics in the regiment and had been while it was the garrison in the city. And uh, at this point, there are two companies of that regiment allowed inside the city walls. And they're commanded by Mountjoy's Lieutenant Colonel, who is one Robert Lundy, uh, who becomes the military governor of the city. And what we're looking at here is an entry in the baptismal register of St. Columns Cathedral, which will show you the, the background uh, or the 
connection that Robert Lundy had with the city. This is the indication of the baptism of his daughter, uh, Araminta, in St. Columns Cathedral in May 1686. And Martha, his wife, was actually the daughter of the uh, Duke, or the, sorry, the, not the Duke, the Dean of Ross. So we've got uh, Lundy with fairly strong connections with the city. Uh, he becomes the military governor. He decides that the city needs uh, reinforcement, that it is very obviously in a state of rebellion, that in the state that it's currently in, it will not be able to resist an attack by a Jacobite army. So what does he do? He gets the corporation, the city council, uh, to repair the battlements around the city walls. He gets them to remove the old rotten carriages and some of the guns around the walls and replace them with new carriages. He, the magazine was here, roughly. Uh, he has uh, an inventory done on the magazine. He finds that there are old muskets, but no furniture, no, no butts on the muskets. There's uh, gunpowder, but it's gone off. Uh, so he's sending letters here, there, and everywhere. He's sending an appeal to London for money. He's sending an appeal for uh, weapons. He's sending an appeal for ammunition. And significantly, on at least three occasions, he sends an appeal to London for what he terms a general officer. Now, that literally means an officer of the rank of general. Because what Lundy realizes is that what is going to happen here is much above the pay scale of a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he's got a prescience that he has never been given credit for. He has, for example, built outside Bishop's Gate what's known as a ravelin or a half moon. Now, it doesn't look in the slightest like a half moon. The French called it a demi loon. Uh, and that's where the, the half moon came from. But this uh, which was probably a little bit farther out than this shows, uh, increased the strength of the fortifications facing south. And if you study the ground, uh, south was the obvious line of advance for any Jacobite army. It was the line that um, would meet least obstacles uh, if you tried to attack the city, for example, across the foil. You were, uh, you were forced into rowing across in boats and meeting the fire from the garrison from the walls. Not only musket fire, but uh, shot from uh, the, the, the guns, the, the culverins and the demi culverins that were, were sighted in the wall. Uh, sorry to intervene. Sorry. Yep. Um, your slides aren't moving there, Richard. Oh no, the, the, the slide, we're only on one slide at the moment. Oh, no, that's okay. This particular one. Uh, that's so the, the main line, uh, and again, we can see Lundy's prescience, was likely to come from the, the southern, the Straban direction, and hence a, a concentration around here. Uh, it's interesting, for example, that um, the, the records tell us that he had two great dunghills removed from the sides of the, the walls. We don't know the exact locations of the dunghills, but uh, the practice in those days was that the, the night soil, as it was uh, euphemistically referred to, was simply dumped over the walls. And by that stage, they, these two great dunghills would have provided very, very uh, convenient ramps for attacking soldiers uh, to, to get onto the walls and get into the city. So Lundy does a tremendous amount to um, to strengthen the, the city's fortifications. And not only does he build this ravelin, but he also builds defensive lines that are concentrated on stopping an attack from, uh, from the south. You can see the line stretching down from the, the city walls down onto what's commonly known as the bog side, uh, then across from the area of the present day Lumen Christi College, uh, down towards the river. Uh, with a number of little outworks in there as well. Uh, he does some other outworks uh, elsewhere, but these are the, the major elements of the fortifications that, that he creates. Lundy was a veteran of the Siege of Tangier. Uh, Tangier, uh, one of the gifts that Charles II got on his, on his uh, 
his wedding as part of the diary of Catherine of Braganza. And it's interesting that a number of the other prominent military characters in this story also were veterans of the siege of Tangier. So they knew a little bit about uh, fighting and they knew a little, little bit about siege warfare. This uh, gun is a demi culverin presented by the Fishmongers in 1642, the Fishmongers Company, uh, one of the companies that had uh, invested in the rebuilding of the city uh, after its destruction. It's known as Roaring Meg. Now, if you walk about the, the city walls today, you'll get some of the guides who will tell you that Meg was the, the wife of one of the gunners. Nonsense, absolute nonsense. Uh, this gun was named after a gun in the English Civil War in the 1640s, which was known as Roaring Meg. And it was because the original Roaring Meg uh, had a very, very loud uh, a crack when it fired, um, out of all proportion to the, the round that it fired. And this particular gun, still sitting on the walls today, although in a completely uh, unhistoric carriage, uh, a field carriage rather than a garrison carriage, uh, also had that, uh, had that uh, sound um, making more noise than it actually did uh, create in, in the terms of destruction. So Roaring Meg, one of the, the cannon, it's the finest collection of 17th century and some of its 16th century cannon uh, in, in Europe today. They're not cannon, but artillery, because uh, there actually is indeed, and I've used the word myself, there isn't a cannon anywhere on the city walls. So James's army is coming up from Dublin, um, and it, it comes up to, uh, it, well, it's, it's meeting, first of all, the other army that has been diverted and gone down the, the, the um, east bank of the foil towards Straban and beyond, across by the bridge at Claddy, uh, bridge which is still there, uh, but has been rebuilt since. Um, so at this point, we've, we're going to have a major battle and there's an army taken out from the city, a force taken out from the city under Lundy. And we're now talking about the end of March, 1689, to meet the Jacobite force that's coming across the, the river. Uh, at this point, and not only here, but uh, up as far as Port Hall, uh, north of Straban. So it's about a five mile front. And the um, garrison from the city comes out, uh, and along the, the, the river, um, uh, it, the River Finn at Claddy, uh, is the, the bridge, which is said is still there. But they demolished the spans of the bridge. The, the uprights uh, remained, the, the piers remained, but the, the spans of the bridge were demolished. And they built little forts on the uh, defensive side, on this side, on the, on the north uh, side of the River Finn. Um, nowadays, soldiers would call them Sangers, but uh, the army hadn't been to Northwest India at that stage, so the word Sanger hadn't ended the vocabulary of soldiers. But they built little forts and they prepared to meet the Jacobite army. And that might have been fine if the Jacobite army had only been infantry, because the Jacobite army was very, very much uh, an improvised organization. It was almost a ragtag and bobtail uh, and force. However, what it did have was a cavalry arm that was as good as any anywhere in Europe at the time. It had the Duke of Berwick, James's illegitimate son, whom we've seen earlier, who by the time of his death was regarded as one of the finest cavalry commanders in Europe. So he had that skill even then. Uh, it had other cavalry commanders like Patrick Sarsfield, who doesn't actually appear in, in the immediate story here, but uh, does figure on the on the on the fringes of it. Uh, and it had another guy, the the um, Rossen, uh, General Ross von Rossen, uh, who's a uh, described by King James himself as a bloody Muscovite that was actually from uh, probably modern Latvia, somewhere up up in that that particular area. And these cavalrymen are heavy cavalry. In other words, they're riding heavy horses that um, will be a, a little bit more akin uh, to heavy dray horses, heavy um, horses that uh, 
were not maybe quite as fast as racehorses, but a lot stronger and could carry a greater burden. And when you imagine that you've got a squadron of cavalry, about 50 or 60 men on these heavy horses coming charging down at you at about 20, 25 miles an hour. Uh, and quite literally, you will feel the ground shaking under you. The river isn't going to stop them. And what did the uh, Williamite defenders and their little forts on this side of the river do? They simply abandoned their positions and they raced back to the shelter of the walls. And it's at that point that Lundy is decried as a traitor. And George Walker, who has made his way uh, to the city uh, from Castle Caulfield, has um, decided that um, Lundy needs to get out, advises him to get out, and actually helps him to get out. Uh, it's interesting that Walker, uh, in his first notes on arriving in the city in March, describes Lundy as very capable and uh, a good commander and so on and so forth, but later on leads the, leads the uh, decrying of Lundy. So there we have the, the River Finn and the, the bridge at Claddy. So the story moves on a little bit, and we move on now uh, coming up to the, the defenders moving back into the city behind the walls. And uh, James arriving up, unaware of the fact that the commander on the spot, Richard Hamilton, uh, and there are lots and lots of Hamiltons in this in this story, and the, there are two Hamilton families. And one of them, in fact, is the same family as the, the modern, in the present day Duke of Abercorn, uh, who, whose family name is Ham, Hamilton. Uh, and uh, James is unaware of the fact that uh, Hamilton has negotiated with the defenders uh, an agreement that for a time, no Jacobite soldiers will approach the city. Totally unaware of that, James rides right up to uh, Bishop's Gate, where he's fired upon by defenders. He was quite confident that when these uh, good folks saw their king, their sovereign king, God's anointed, uh, they would see sense and they would give him their obedience. Uh, he really was extremely disappointed and came quote, very, very close to being killed. In fact, an officer beside him on horseback was killed at Bishop's Gate. Uh, by this stage, the defenders had actually managed to hoist two guns onto the, the, the tower of St. Collins Cathedral, uh, an impressive uh, piece of workmanship at that stage, uh, uh, engineering, getting two heavy uh, guns, which had actually come from Colmore Fort onto, onto the tower. So James then moves uh, back. He moves initially that day to Foyle Hill, roughly the, the road known as Southway, now on the other side of the um, other side of the valley, if you like, uh, because the original hill of Derry uh, was there. It was an island because the Foyle split into two and what is uh, the low ground below the walls, known as the, the bog side and likely road, was actually one arm of the foil. So James moves uphill and he sits in uh, a wet April drizzle and he looks down at, at the city. Uh, and if you go into the old Bank of Ireland in um, College Green in Dublin, which was the Irish Houses of Parliament, uh, and you get into the boardroom, you will find that there's a beautiful tapestry there showing James sitting on his horse from Foyle Hill, quite close to the entrance to the monastery at Termenbaca, uh, looking down and wondering what exactly had gone wrong. He then moves down to the fort uh, here, and uh, the, the name of the fort has just gone out of my head completely. Um, I remember my father taking me to it nearly Oh gosh, I was going to say nearly 50 years ago, it was nearly 60 years ago, uh, and I still can't remember the name of it. Um, he moved from there in his disappointment a little bit further down to Kevin Accor House, uh, where he had lunch in the garden under a tree. And this is all that remains of the tree. Way back in the 1987, there was a there was a massive storm and the tree was destroyed. Uh, this remains today there. Uh, but James actually gave a note of protection to Cavanagh Court House and in East Donegal, it's uh, 
one of the very few large Protestant owned houses that actually survived the, the depredations of the Jacobite army as they pulled away uh, from the siege of Derry. So within the, the city, we've got Lundy who has been advised to leave and does leave. Um, he's succeeded as governor by Colonel Henry Baker. Baker uh, is another of the Tangerines, as they were known, a veteran of the siege of Tangier. He had served with Lundy in Tangier. And Baker becomes governor and remains governor until he dies at the end of June, and is succeeded by uh, Jonathan Mitchellburn, whom we'll see shortly. Sorry to bother um, you there, Richard. Um, the screen is stuck on the letter of Chacon. Letter, has it moved oh, with you? Yes, it's moved with me. Sorry, I, okay. I'll go back to um, I'll go back to the letter and see if I can bring you. Sorry about that there. I didn't want to buy you for your in a run, you know. Uh, right, that's you've got the letter. Yeah. Have you got the map now? No, it's stuck on the letter for some reason. Oh, let's see if we can do anything about that. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. So there's something up here telling me my screen sharing has paused. No. Let's see if I can start this again. Okay. Can you see the map? Nope. Nope. Uh, Stuck on the letters, right. Now you're back to your home screen where it just says your name. Right. I've got the map showing now. Can you see the map? No, we can't. Um, right. Uh, let's see if, if I go out of this, hopefully. Um, let's see. You're not getting any change there at all? No, nothing. Nothing. Let's see if I can. Uh, no, I'm just getting it. Um, right. Uh, are you getting the full view of all the slides now? Nope, we can't see anything. Just oh. your name. Right. Uh, let's see. Are you seeing King Louis the Fourteenth now? Nope, nothing at all. Nothing. I don't know what is happening here. I'll end the show. Okay. Uh, come out of it. Uh, try it all over again. Okay, dead on. Thanks. Let's see if we... Have you lost the picture there completely? Yeah, it's just your name, Richard. Right. Now... Right. I have you as co-host, but maybe I should make you host here. Okay. Right, I'll make you host. Right. Yes. Have you got the title? I'm okay. Siege of Derry? No, it's just your name. Oh, gosh. No. All these things happen. They they do. <laughs> <laughs> what what have you got now? Just your name, Richard. All right. Uh, what have you got now? Uh, there, there's your screen now. Ah, right. Okay. Um. Have I very hurriedly run through all the slides then? Um, yeah. the, 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 the overall, I, I'm, you, you stopped seeing it at that, the letter from Chirconnell, wasn't that right? Yes, that's correct, yep. Okay, so you've seen all of this. Uh, Chirconnell's letter, and then they showed the, the map of Ulster and the, the various points of, of conflict. Uh, Ezekiel Hopkins, the, the uh, Bishop of, of Derry at the time, the padlocks and the keys for the city gates, the city, the shutting of the gates uh, window in the cathedral, the, the, the register showing the baptismal or uh, baptism of uh, Aramintha Lundy. And uh, then we had the, the, um, the plan, not the plan view, but the bird's eye view of the, the um, 
City and his defences, and this little one as well, Roaring Meg, uh, Claddy, Claddy Bridge. Oh, Claddy Bridge doesn't want to come and see us at all. Let's see. Yeah, there we are, Claddy Bridge. Uh, and I couldn't remember the name of the fort. It's Mon Gavelin, um, just, uh, just slightly north of, of Lifford. Kevin Accor House, where he was given hospitality, uh, and the tree that under which he picnicked in Kevin Accor House. So we come on to Henry Baker. Uh, I think that's where we, we stopped, wasn't it? About Henry Baker. Uh, and uh, I say Henry Baker was the, the first governor succeeded when he died by Jonathan uh, Mitchellborn. So, how do you explain this? Uh, from St. Columns Cathedral, the Reverend George Walker, uh, Governor of Londonderry. Uh, well, back, George Walker was never the governor of the city. He was an assistant to Henry Baker, uh, but liked to call himself the governor. And he wrote the first account of the siege. So in other words, he became the received wisdom. Uh, and uh, like everybody that rushes into print immediately afterwards, uh, basically set the story. So he, he described himself as the governor, but uh, he was simply the man uh, who was responsible for administration rather than the defences. He had no military training whatsoever. This is a, another uh, image of a minister of Dungannon and governor of London, Derry. Note the, the way it's split London and Derry and Derry in the old uh, spelling IE rather than the Y. Uh, a, a clergyman with a sword and a pistol. Uh, and there are accounts which say that he was in his 70s. In fact, he was in his 40s. This one looks a bit more like a man in his 70s. He, he did actually have a fine portrait of himself uh, commissioned by an artist. And you will notice, if you think back to the earlier images that I showed of um, James II, for example, in armor, uh, and I think the, the Duke of Berwick in armor, you, you will notice that it's looks like the same suit of armor. In many cases, in fact, it is the same suit of armor because what you had in those days was a form of Photoshop before photos had even been thought of. And the artist merely painted the head of the, of the, of the subject and an artist's apprentice would have painted a suit of armor and the artist did the finishing touches. So they, they were Photoshopping long before uh, Photoshopping had been invented. Some of the other people involved inside, John Harvey, uh, almost forgotten, was the keeper of the stores uh, and a difficult job he must have had because of the, the, the problems that, that, that they had in terms of food and so forth, although they were quite well off for food at the beginning of the siege. They needed um, a commander or they felt they needed a, an aggressive commander who would take the, the war uh, to the enemy uh, as governor. This was the, the popular feeling. And of course, popular feeling doesn't always work out. And this man is Adam Murray, who is a local farmer who has come in uh, and has already shown considerable military skill. Now, it's very, very difficult in history to find people who become good military commanders who didn't have a military background. Uh, there are basically really only two good examples of that. One is Oliver Cromwell. And the other is Stonewall Jackson. Uh, but there's a third one, Adam Murray, because unless he had served in the army at some stage that we don't know of, and there is no record of that, uh, this man came from nowhere to be a superb commander uh, in the course of the siege. Uh, and no wonder that people already wanted him to become governor. He leads forays against um, Jacobite troops north of the city, at Pennyburn and at Ellick Moor. And in both instances, he beats the, the attackers. In both cases, there are senior French officers. Uh, today, they'd be known as military advisors, but they were the rank of major general, uh, Maumont and Poussignon. And uh, in both cases, it's with dire consequences. Uh, Maumont was killed, Poussignon survived, but only survived because he got a French doctor rather than an Irish doctor. Uh, French were about a century ahead of almost everybody else in terms of treating battlefield trauma. Um, so we, we also have 
uh, Jonathan Mitchellborn, who is the, the, the next uh, and final governor of Derry during the siege, uh, and the man who left the city the crimson flag uh, and the, uh, the, the association of the colour crimson with, with the city. Uh, but we'll, we'll come on to Mitchellborn shortly. Um, if we look at the city now, uh, the, the bog where the river used to flow right across here around the, the island of, of Derry, we have the Jacobites encamped in an arc to the west. We have the Jacobites. In... Sorry? We have the Jacobites encamped in the arc to the east as well. We've got artillery and batteries uh, on either side of the We've got what I'll try and mute please the people here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've got Pennyburn Mill, which I mentioned the battle there, but a little bit farther north at uh, the site of Boom Hall, roughly where the Foyle Bridge now crosses the river, uh, a, br a boom was built by the, uh, the, 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 the attackers to prevent any resupply of the city by water. Uh, and it was, it was built by a French naval engineer called Jean-Marie de Jean, who is the, this year the Marquis de Pointy, uh, sometimes known as Mr. Pointy. Uh, and the first boom that he built across the river was built of oak and promptly sank because the oak was so heavy. They then created uh, a, a new boom from fir. Uh, logs. Some of them were probably from houses that had been demolished, and those were joined together by chains and ropes right across the city, across the river, uh, in order to prevent uh, any uh, relief fleet coming up uh, to uh, bring sustenance, ammunition, reinforcements, or whatever to the city. Uh, at this stage, one um, relief force has already uh, arrived as they were fighting the battle at, at um, Claddy uh, and along the river line, uh, two regiments uh, arrived in the city and were promptly told to go away by Lundy when he got back, because by that stage, I think Lundy had lost all spirit and had, uh, no hope of uh, anything successful happening. So the, the two officers commanding those, Cunningham and Richards, uh, were later cashiered, sacked from the army uh, for failing in their duty. So the boom is now going to stop anybody coming back up that river to bring uh, support to the city. We look at the, the cathedral as it was in those days, a lot smaller, the, the chancel which is there today. Um, of course, the cathedral ends here. The chancel is now over here. The tower was much shorter. But even so, hoisting two heavy guns up onto that was quite quite a piece of, of uh, work for the engineers who did it. And uh, again, a, a, another view from the front of the cathedral. One of the other attacks that was made came from the south. One of the early attacks in the south was the, the Battle of Windmill Hill, which is roughly occurred in the grounds of the present day Lumen Christie College um, between those grounds and the River Foyle. Uh, and in the course of that battle, the, um, there were two battles of Windmill Hill in the course of uh, which uh, the defenders uh, prevailed. Uh, and in one of those battles, the commander of the Jacobite force uh, was killed. And that was a, a, a colonel or a brigadier, Ramsey. Uh, the French supplies to the Jacobites, the French support, uh, included flags. And in those days, um, it was the companies, the, 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 the separate companies of a regiment that carried battle flags so that they could be easily identified. Uh, the a focal point for the company where the officer were commanding could be easily identified in battle. These, um, are now in the St. Collins Cathedral. These were captured at the Battle of Wendell Hill. The, the staffs are original. The fleur-de-lis embroidery on the flags is uh, 
is uh, original as well. The actual fabric of the flags has been renewed, I think, at least twice. And uh, it's a little bit like Prigley Broom, for those of you who are fans of only fools and horses. And the color is probably wrong as well, because the French color was a, a very uh, off white called um, gris blanc, gray white. Uh, and that certainly is more the color of a gris blanc flag having been stained by candlelight uh, over many, many decades before the first restoration was made. And then the ladies who made the restoration, assuming that the fabric was actually originally the color that was now stained, um, did the same thing again. And it was done the next time uh, as well. Now, we've got a, a very uh, nice looking representation uh, of the Siege of Derry by a contemporary Dutch artist, Romain de Hoog. Now, de Hoog came nowhere near the city, but he listened to people, he talked to people, uh, and he created this impression. Now, it's, it's not bad, it's not good, and certainly not accurate. Uh, but one point that is very, very well worth remembering is that the masters of propaganda, or PR, publicity, or whatever you want to call it, in the 17th century were the Dutch. Uh, and this is one clear example of just how good they were at it. So you can see the outworks uh, as he has created them. You can see the attacking soldiers or uh, attempting to attack. You can see the artillery emplacements. Uh, and it does, uh, with quite a number of reservations, give you an idea of what was, was actually happening. Um, Another idea of what was happening is the city in flames. Uh, this is a, 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 an artist's impression, a sketch that was done, uh, I think, as a woodcut at much, that, much the same time. And then we also have this map of Captain Francis Neville, which is reasonably, reasonably good. Uh, it gives a very good depiction of the, of the walls, uh, of the curvature of the river. It actually even shows you the old river. Uh, which became, uh, when it sunk up, it came down to the width of a burn, which was known as Mary Blue's Burn. Uh, and is actually still there, runs under the, the Lecky Road in Russell Street and Sackler Street back into the foil uh, in, a, in a very large culvert, which used to flood fairly regularly, a uh, combination of heavy rains and high tides, uh, and you could be guaranteed that this whole area was, was covered in water. Uh, it's... Uh, Pretty good depiction showing the Jacobite camps around the modern day Craigan estate and farther across the, the river uh, where Ebrington Barracks uh, stands, Strong's Orchard, and up on the higher ground, the waterside and on um, Cotton Scale. Um, another little stretch of, that, of uh, Neville's uh, map uh, showing the encampments, uh, showing the boom across the river. Uh, we'll come back to the boom uh, in a little while. And uh, again, it's, it's reasonably accurate uh, as we follow it down by the Otter Bank, uh, north of the, of the boom, uh, and around the, close to the area of, uh, coming close to the area of the modern uh, foil port of the Sahali. Uh, and there we have a, a closer idea of the boom. Uh, stretching across the river, uh, protected by artillery battles or bat batteries on either side. Uh, and a battery really uh, wasn't a small unit of artillery as it is today. It was simply the position on which a gun sat at that time. So we can see the uh, locations of, of encampments uh, by uh, the Jacobites on either side of the river. One is specifically mentioned here, Lord Clancarty, and uh, we will come on to him again shortly. Uh, and some dragoons, a cavalry regiment, uh, really horse soldiers uh, who rode the battle on horses and got off and fought on foot. So these are Sir, Sir Neil O'Neill's dragoons who are encamped in this area. Uh, again, a uh, a very fanciful drawing. Uh, it's, it comes from a, a, a book written by the one and only apprentice girl of Derry, Charlotte Elizabeth, who was 
who wrote a history of the siege uh, and uh, who was made an honorary member of the Apprentice Boys as a result of that. Uh, now, and that actually, looking at the soldiers, looking at the officer on horseback, you can tell, of course, that it was done much, much later, and the artist just simply used uh, soldiers from his time as the model. So this, these are actually early 19th century soldiers, uh, and I don't honestly think that we're marching back in time to attack the city. So we've got another Dutch view here, uh, but we can see the Penny Burn Mill, which is referred to as the Penny Brook Mill. But we can see the, the, the four gates, the Butcher Gate, uh, the, the, the Bishop's Gate with the Ravelin, which becomes much, much bigger in this one, as you can notice. Windmill Hill, well, that's actually closer to, in fact, it's in the grounds of Lumen Christie College. Uh, you've got the Ferry Gate, which is where the um, Jacobite Reconnaissance Party of officers came up um, when the gates were shut in front of them. Then we've got the Shipkey Gate, which is on the Ship Key. Now, of course, today, uh, there's a, a fair distance between the walls and the river at that point, but there wasn't in those days. The, the river came right up to the ship key uh, and all of that ground in which the guild hall, for example, stands and the expressway behind it, that's all reclaimed ground. Um, another artist's impression, and again, although it's very, very fanciful in terms of the city, in terms of the, the greater background, what is very accurate here are the uh, the gabions, these huge uh, straw, or not straw, but wicker baskets, which are filled with soil, filled with stones to protect artillery, uh, to protect soldiers. And uh, we've got a, a large mortar firing here. Uh, mortar actually from an old German word meaning sea mortar, sea monster, uh, first used by the Turks against the uh, European ships. Uh, in, in the, I think, in the Black Sea. Uh, and this is possibly the mortar, the very mortar that fired the uh, terms of surrender, the offer of surrender into the city in late July uh, or mid July. Uh, and the shell from which is actually in the porch of St. Collins Cathedral to this day. Looking down uh, from what would have been Jacobite artillery and infantry positions in the modern city. Uh, and the photograph is, is quite old because this uh, junction is now what's referred to by traffic engineers as a, a dumbbell roundabout. But you can see the difficulties that the attackers would have had trying to get up this slope, which is quite steep up to the walls. Nonetheless, they did try uh, at the end of June uh, you can see how much gentler the slope is uh, running down towards the, the towards the south. Um, again, we're back to the uh, we're back to the artists' impressions. The the Dutch artists in particular. You see the the rainbow or uh, the sorry the one ball keeps moving according to whichever artist is doing it. You can see the infantry uh, with the muskets firing. Um, and I'm not too sure whether some of those have actually got bayonets, but, uh, but uh, that's quite doubtful because the bayonet had only been invented in 1640. And the um, early bayonets were plug bayonets, so you couldn't actually fire the musket. Later bayonets were uh, used by the English army uh, and, and could actually fire because the, ba the bayonet uh, fitted over the barrel rather than into the barrel. Um, by this stage, a Jacobite, or um, sorry, a Williamite relief fleet under Major General Percy Kirk arrived in the foil. There are all sorts of confusion. Um, they see the red flag flying from uh, St. Collins Cathedral. Um, and the problem about this is that although navies had adopted a system of signaling by flags. It actually was quite an old system at that stage. Armies hadn't done quite the same thing. And as far as armies were concerned, as far as soldiers were concerned, there were two, two colors of flag. One was red, blood red, and the other was white. White flag didn't mean surrender. It was an offer to talk, which could lead to surrender, which is why you term it nowadays, putting out the red flag, putting out the white flag actually means surrendering. But the red flag was 
defiance. It means we're here to stay and we're going to fight and we're going to die if we have to. So the red flag is flying from uh, St. Columns Cathedral from the tower and the fleet is sitting uh, above Culmore in Loch Boyle and it is not making any effort to get up. And yet the city's in desperation because rations are being reduced, people are dying, there's illness, there's very, very serious illness, the contagion that comes from many people being uh, kept close together, there's a shortage of water and so forth. Um, so they, they start running the flag up and down the flagpole uh, and this is taken by Kirk and his officers as a signal that all is well. We're, we're doing fine well here, so we, we don't worry too much about us. So he takes the fleet out of Loch Foyle, around on a shown, and into Loch Swilly. And he encamps on Inch Island, even builds a camp, even builds a hospital on Inch Island. And in spite of efforts to contact them, uh, to say, you know, we, we definitely need you here. Uh, it's quite some time before uh, the, the Irish arm, or before the um, William Mount Army actually decides to come back around again. And it's only after a couple of messengers have, have uh, made fairly dangerous journeys. Um, some of them come around by ship, others march over land, uh, come across. All of this ground incidentally would have been uh, inundated at that stage, it's all been reclaimed. And they would have, the, the fastest way to the city would have been to march across the shoulder of Green and Mountain, uh, which they didn't. They march across the the, uh, the low ground uh, on the what became the main Bong Crana Road, uh, joining up with that not some not some distance from uh, uh, Green, um, which turned a five mile march into about an eight to nine mile march, uh, which wasn't very much help. Now at that stage, this is uh, the Duke of Berwick again. James is a legitimate son, uh, James Fitz James. Uh, and he's running cavalry raids into Donegal and even farther afield. He's destroying what he doesn't take away. So he, he is actually the first man to use a scorched earth policy in, in Ireland, and he does it elsewhere in Ireland during the course of the, the Williamite Jacobite War. And so he's a pretty dangerous character as far as uh, the, de the defenders are concerned. Um, as I say, the um, food has now become very, very scarce. And this is um, allegedly a, a shopping list or a list of what was available. It's certainly not a menu, but it's showing you what uh, rations there were. Now, considering that there were full salmon issued, full salmon being issued to people at the start of the siege and uh, quite good. Uh, uh, quite good rations. They're coming down to things like the quarter of a dollar. Uh, and you look at the price of this, which was beyond the means of an awful lot of people. And it's at this point that that huge mortar shell was fired into the city, offering surrender terms. They, of course, refused to surrender uh, as they had done before. And indeed, the, the term no surrender comes from that incident that I referred to with James coming up to the Bishop's Gate on the 18th of April. So Kirk's fleet comes back into Loch Foyle and an attempt is made at the end of July uh, to break the boom. Now we, we're told, uh, have been told for centuries that the local ship, the Mountjoy, under Captain Michael and Micaiah Browning, broke the boom, the Browning was killed in the, in the, in the action. In fact, the, the Mountjoy never broke the boom. The Mountjoy bounced off the boom and uh, grounded on the far bank of the foil. And Browning was killed in the fire from the Jacobites on possibly the, the west side or even the east side of the river. Uh, it's claimed that he was the only person killed on the ship. And the amount, uh, the number of musket balls that were flying about, that, that's unlikely. Uh, what actually did happen was that a Royal Navy warship, HMS Swallow, put over its uh, longboat 
and the soldiers in the longboat, or the sailors in the longboat, approached the boom and used hatchets to smash the, uh, the chains and the ropes in the boom. Uh, and we know that for a fact because the man who broke the boom, Bosun's mate John Shelley, Seaman Henry Bremen, Jonathan Field, Alexander Hunter, James Jemison, Robert Kells, Miles Tong, Jeremy Vinson, William Welcome, and Jonathan Young were all given 10 pounds for their part in the action of breaking the boom. And that is in Admiralty records. Uh, so we know what happened and we know who really broke the boom. It wasn't the Mountjoy. The Mountjoy is depicted as sailing into Derry uh, in this image of the relief of the city. Uh, again, one of the windows in St. Collins Cathedral. Mountjoy was actually towed by a longboat because there was no wind that evening. The Mountjoy and the Phoenix and the Jerusalem uh, that evening and the next morning uh, brought relief to the city. And as the Jacobites watched this happening, uh, they realized that the game was up as far as they were concerned. They began breaking camp and moving away from the city. Destroying as they went, they burned the bridge at Coleraine. Uh, they destroyed houses belonging to uh, Protestant people in Donegal, with the exception of Cabinet Court House, as we've already mentioned. Um, and uh, of, of course, at this stage, um, Henry Baker had died at the end of the uh, end of the month of June, been succeeded by uh, Jonathan Mitchellborn. Michael Browning had died uh, on the ship Mountjoy, and they're both uh, commemorated uh, in St. Columns Cathedral, where in fact they're they're both buried. Uh, so you can see the memorial to them in the, the cathedral. Uh, which bears the, the motto, which is the city's motto. Henry Baker, a governor of the city during the siege, um, in the rather diplomatic wording of a governor. He was the governor. Uh, but this is because, of course, um, George Walker was the bishop designate of Derry until he was killed at the Boyne the following summer. Uh, so Henry Baker and Michael Browning Again, a native of the city uh, and captain of the Mountjoy, which was a city a ship from the city, uh, killed at the boom in the hour of victory while encouraging his men in the face of terrible danger on the 28th of July, 1689. Um, it's now commemorated on the 12th of August. Uh, and in fact, more likely, there are three pretty reliable, well, pretty um, well known local uh, accounts. Uh, one written by George Walker, in fact, there are two Walker's accounts, but one written by George Walker, one written by the Reverend Mackenzie, who's a Presbyterian minister, and the other written by Captain Ash. Uh, and Captain Ash just didn't come to light public, uh, public attention for, I think, about 150 years. This is probably the more accurate, but you will find that the, the dates vary from the 28th to the 30th of, of um, July, uh, and hence the latter, late last date really is the one that's been chosen to be marked today uh, on the 12th of August. And on the, the city walls uh, overlooking Shipkey Place and looking across the Guildhall is this monument uh, to Browning and the, the Mountjoy, one of the uh, signs, one of the commemorative points uh, that are commemorative indicators for the siege. The, the siege began being uh, commemorated in a, a very, very major fashion uh, in a very, very short space of time, but it really took off in the centenary of the, uh, the, the siege uh, when there was a, a huge march and a huge celebration in the city. This, this doesn't actually uh, relate to the, the centenary march, but it's interesting uh, that the Catholic Bishop of Derry took part in the centenary march. Uh, and the Dean of Derry at the time, the Anglican Dean of Derry was one John Hume, uh, no relation at all of the recently deceased uh, John Hume, the politician. Uh, but interestingly, that particular Catholic um, Bishop of Derry, Charles O'Donnell was known far and wide as Orange Charlie. Um, here we have 
Walker's pillar, which is on the walls. All that remains now is the, the stump that was blown up in 1973 uh, and has never been restored. Although the statue of Walker uh, suffered relatively little damage uh, and it's plummeted to the ground and is now uh, be in the Siege Museum in Society Street beside the Apprentice Boys Memorial Hall. I haven't been able to cover absolutely everything uh, but what I, I have said gives you a, a flavour of the, the Siege of Derry. I did mention the, the European dimensions, uh, for example, the, um, the, the, the ambitions of Louis XIV, uh, which created this huge alliance against them called the, the, uh, the Grand Alliance or the League of Augsburg. Uh, he had managed to offend just about everybody. He had offended the Pope uh, by deciding that it was up to him to appoint an archbishop in a German state uh, and not the Pope. Uh, so that, that uh, made sure that when Williams and the, the Estates General from the Netherlands came looking for money, that the Pope went to his family and said, give them money, we want, we want to uh, curtail what this Louis XIV guy is doing. Uh, but more to the point, in 1683, um, and significantly we're just uh, a, a few days from the end of a particular siege, the siege of Vienna, uh, Vienna came under siege from the Ottoman Empire, so the, the Turks were moving up into Europe. Vienna was the seat of the Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Emperor appealed to Louis XIV as a fellow Catholic monarch for support. Louis XIV dithered, dithered deliberately because Louis XIV was intending to wait and see exactly what happened. Uh, and wait for the Austrians to um, suffer at the hands of the, 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 the Turks and uh, then to move in and clean up and uh, advance French interests. It, uh, as a result, no French relief force was sent, but a Polish relief force was sent under King John Sobieski. And it was the Polish army, it was John Sobieski's army, which actually ended the siege, it ended it without actually conflicting in uh, the area of Vienna with the, with the Turks, uh, but ended it because suddenly one morning the defenders of Vienna woke up and the Turks who had been in camps all around were no longer there. Their tents were there, their equipment was there, their, their rations and so forth were there. And uh, just to end on, a, on a, an interesting uh, note, uh, cultural or social note or whatever you like to call it. Uh, there was a, a monk, uh, sorry, he wasn't a monk, he was a Franciscan, there are no Franciscan monks, a friar, uh, went out to have a look through the Turkish camp and he discovered, uh, he knew that Turks drank this vile uh, drink, which was called cafe, kafir uh, in those days. And uh, he found the, the coffee beans and he managed to concoct a, a drink. Um, he thought that the drink was absolutely vile and he said, no, having no more of that. And then he had a second thought and because he had found also their uh, honey. Uh, so he made the drink a second time and he put honey into it and he got cream and uh, he put the cream onto it. And if you had a cappuccino this morning, that's where it came from. The monk was the friar, sorry, uh, was a member of the Capuchin suborder of the Franciscan order. And uh, we don't know his name. We do know he was a Capuchin and he invented Cappuccino. The uh, Holy Roman Emperor decreed that the pastry cooks of Vienna should uh, create a confection to mark the defeat of the Turks. They did so by creating a cake in the shape of the Islamic crescent. We know that confection today as a piece of bread called a croissant. So we get a croissant with our cappuccino this morning. You were remembering the siege of Vienna and the connections between the siege of Vienna and the siege of Derry. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, sorry about the problems with the, the slides earlier on. Okay Stephen back to you.
Thank you very much, Richard. That was absolutely brilliant. You covered a lot in that. Um, very, very thorough. Um, I have one question for you, if that's okay. Yep. It's from a tour guide in there. You probably know him, David Douglas. Yes. Oh, yep. Did any of the Red Shank Garrison get into the city in December 1688? Some people say of them hiding. Uh, no, uh, the, the Red Shanks, the regiment itself, the, the ordinary soldiers stayed on the east bank of the river. It was only a group of officers with the, the modern uh, military call reconnaissance party or in our group uh, who, who came across and it was the reconnaissance uh, group that was denied entrance by the closing of the uh, the ferry gate, first of all, and then the closing of the of the other gates. They, they beat a pretty hasty retreat across uh, the water again. Dead on. Um, there's a lot of very uh, good comments. Thanking you, Richard, for coming on. Um, thank you. I think at this point, I just say thank you very much for coming on. You know, it's very good of you. And Not you're, a more, you're more than welcome to come on again. That was fascinating. Excellent talk. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, thank you. Everybody's thank you. tuned in tonight and to Reese as well for opening up the talk. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you. Cheers, Warren. A lot more good comments there, so I'll just switch this off now.